these cuts, even not drastic ones, but significant ones, come with risk. That when you're cutting a certain capacity, it means you're not gonna be able to operate as effectively, perhaps, as you have in the past. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, making cuts in defense spending. The numbers are staggering. Somewhere between $400 billion and $1.5 trillion could be cut from the nation's defense budget in months to come. As a means to trim the deficit, policymakers are talking about ways to save money on defense while keeping the country safe and strong. With competing priorities from weapons purchases to health care expenditures on the table, the debate could lose focus, says expert Peter W. Singer. The worst case scenario is that we don't have a smart deal on the tax side and on the entitlement side, and we make drastic cuts only on the discretionary spending side that hit our national security apparatus particularly hard. So we come out of that with no solution to the actual debt and deficit problem and a weakened national security apparatus. Then on top of that, the question of how we go about it can be either done smart or dumb. And the fear of the worst case is we go about it in a dumb way. We keep maximum commitments out there, and yet we just keep on doing the same thing. And then the way we go about the cuts is this, what they call the salami slice method, where basically you cut everything by the same amount. It sounds fair, except the result is that you cut the bad by the same amount that you cut the good. And also, you don't force the kind of structural changes that might better set the military up for the future by dealing with, be it personnel issues, acquisitions issues, how you're structuring your force and like. You don't make any changes. So you keep trying to do the same with less, and basically you end up with a contradiction. And that's how great powers stop being great powers. Will cuts make the nation less safe? at greater risk? What we have to be able to do is prioritize. That is, how you navigate this world of increased risk is you, you set priorities and follow them. You figure out what's important and what's not as important, and you distribute your resources around that. And again, to me, this is a positive if we come out of this exercise with that kind of lesson, because it means regardless of the level of spending that we have now or in the future, we'll have a smarter foreign policy. And one of your guidelines for making really good choices about these cuts is to follow the money. Explain that, please. There's a famous saying that w the bank robber Willie Sutton had when he was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. Well, the problem in how we usually talk about defense cuts is we often focus on this program or that program. I don't like this jet fighter, we should cut it, or I, um, we should have less of this one. The reality in the Pentagon's budget is that about 30 cents out of every dollar is spent on new weapons. The other 70 cents of that weapon spending is on maintaining them. So if you could actually figure out how to go about that in a more effective manner, you would get more savings. Um, same thing when it comes to uh, health care and benefits and personnel system. Much of the military's growth in its budget is because of those areas. Essentially, we have a model of how we go about um, running our personnel system on the Pentagon that is taken from the 1950s. And we've seen the corporate world move away from that model, and we haven't seen the military move away. And so we have a generation from the Google era that's dealing with the General Motors type s system, and it's not working. There is actually a school of thought saying that we should just reduce our spending to pre-9-11 levels. Would that help? Some people um, say, you know, why don't we just go back to pre-9-11 spending? Bin Laden's dead. If we just go back to those amounts, everything should be solved. And oh, by the way, look at all the spending that we did in the last decade. Shouldn't we have gotten something out of that so we can sort of live off of that fat for a while, right? Well, the problem of that view is it ignores reality. It ignores the fact that um, the U.S. military didn't sort of sit around for the decade after 9-11 just gathering up and spending on new equipment and keeping it in the garage. It went out and used it in operations. And so most of that new added spending basically has sort of disappeared. We have a force 
that, yeah, a lot was spent on it, but we've got vehicles that have been um, driven well past what they were anticipated. We've got systems that are well past their estimated lifetimes. So it's not like having, you know, a new car in, in, the, in the garage that's never been driven. It's an old car that needs some fixing. The other part of this that's um, important is anyone says, well, return to 2001 levels of spending. Well, guess what? Technology and the needs for the U.S. military has changed since 2001. 2001, you didn't have um, unmanned systems uh, used in a major way. So we've gone from zero to 7,000 in the air, roughly zero to 12,000 on the ground. You have a much different military, and it needs to continue to evolve in that way. Same thing, cyber warfare. You had no cyber command back then. What, you're going to get rid of it now? So basically, um, the needs are different. Peter, you've underscored that these cuts need to be approached with some deliberation, and then they need to be executed in a very smart way. What is the best outcome from this process? Congress acts in a smart and mature way, the way we voted for them to supposedly act. We don't let the extremes of the political parties drive the process. Instead, they strike a deal that reflects both smart policy and what the American public wants. That is a deal that engages in tax and entitlement reform and tries to trim discretionary spending where it makes sense. You hit those three parts that actually matter. In the spending on the national security space, if you're going to make cuts, you go about it in a way that's smart. You identify your priorities, you identify a process for doing it, you go after where the real spending is, and don't just salami slice. And you leave a U.S. military that maybe not as much is being spent on, but is better equipped for the future. And then you have that military packaged within a, stra a strategic outlook, a strategy or you've set priorities, and you're figuring out what matters and what doesn't, and when and where I deploy force. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.